2016 has become the year of political instability. Populist parties are strengthening across Europe, and a lot of us are still shell-shocked from Trump's victory in the 2016 U.S. presidential election. Here to talk about that election, its causes, and what we should be doing in its wake is Sarah Kenzior, an op-ed columnist for the Globe and Mail who focuses on U.S. politics. She's also the U.S. correspondent for the Dutch news outlet, The Correspondent, and her writings have been featured in publications across the globe. Thanks for joining us, Sarah. Oh, thank you for having me. Um, I just want to go back to that election night that kind of shocked so many of us. Um, I remember watching it and still thinking at that point um, that there's no way Trump could possibly win. I'm just wondering when the first instance uh, you kind of suspected Trump may emerge victorious from the from the political contest. I mean, I always thought he had a chance, you know, and I wrote for the Globe and Mail about that, how in Thanksgiving of 2015, I, I tweeted, you know, treasure this time because this may be the last Thanksgiving, not under a, uh, you know, Trump uh, administration or at least just president-elect. Uh, I think he always had a much stronger chance than um, people realized. People downplayed his chances during the primary and they did uh, during the election. I think that um, the actions of uh, certain individuals, particularly Clearly, James Comey of the FBI and Mm -hmm. members of the media during the last two weeks um, tilted it so that Clinton has had less of a chance. Um, You know, she certainly had been stronger in that that latter month. Uh, But, you know, I I always thought it was going to be close. Uh, I live in Missouri, you know, which is now a very red state. Um, It was kind of a purple state before. And so I'm surrounded by by Trump supporters. I attended the rallies, um, you know, and I saw the his appeal, I guess, if you could call it that, in action. What, uh, like, about that appeal, what do you think that appeal has been? It's interesting that you've mentioned that uh, you've kind of been on the ground floor of seeing, you know, his his popularity amongst um, the electorate. What is his appeal fundamentally to these voters? Uh, I mean, it's it's varied. This is not a monolithic group of voters at all. Um, sure. You know, and I've spent time interviewing them, and also they're just you know, people who live around me, so I see them on an informal basis. Um, There are some who, you know, are racist or bigoted or xenophobic, and that kind of rhetoric was genuinely appealing to him. Uh, There are a lot of people who've been hit very hard by uh, the recession and its aftermath. Um, The recession never really ended out here. A -hmm. lot of jobs have been lost, and, you know, Trump is accurate in describing, um, you know, that kind of economic climate as very dire. I don't think any of his proposed solutions or cabinet members are going to do anything uh, to assuage that or help it in any way. I think he's actually going to build a kleptocracy, but he certainly, you know, advertised himself as a populist candidate who is going to restore jobs that had been lost. Mm -hmm. Um, Then there are other folks who are just longtime Republicans, haters of Hillary Clinton, um, pro-life voters, you know, they vote, everyone votes for their own reason. Um, But I think that, you know, our our media um, and certain members of our government did a really terrible job at uh, honestly evaluating the policy plans of Trump and Clinton. It was Mm -hmm. very much about personalities. um, And they also really played down aspects of Trump's track record of corruption and, uh, you know, bad business dealings that I think are extremely relevant now that he's president-elect and seems to be making those same kind of moves in office. Uh, So I'm guessing there's going to be some some buyer's remorse uh, once he actually (laughs) is in charge. Right. Um, The lot that you've mentioned there I want to pick up on. Um, The first thing is just what do you think the long-term um, kind of causes are of this almost maybe willful blindness that you've mentioned? Because I'm thinking, you know, it, you could pick any moment from his campaign, but, you know, maybe the moment when he mocked that uh, disabled reporter and any other election, it would seem that that would have been the moment that a candidate would have failed. And he has has just kept going. What are the conditions that are letting people kind of excuse um, or even condone that kind of behavior? Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting question, because I think that most Americans uh, were genuinely offended by that, and were offended by, you know, many of the disparaging remarks mm-hmm. he made, including from day one when he launched his campaign uh, with an attack on Mexicans, you know, saying they were right. rapists and murderers. Um, part of the problem is that he's made so many inflammatory and hateful comments and has had so many scandals that it was very difficult, I think, for people to sort of keep up with it um, because the media cycle moves very fast. There's also a lot of rationalization. There's also flat-out denial. Mm -hmm. You know, Trump would deny saying things that he said on camera, you know, and during the vice presidential debate, Pence denied, you know, these events taking place. And so there's an attempt to gaslight the public, um, to falsely represent Trump as something that he wasn't. Uh, And, you know, just 
just very poor reporting. And at the same time, you know, there was a lot of projection, a lot of the things that people were saying about Clinton, you know, that she was uh, corrupt, that she had, uh, you know, a conflict of interest between her business dealings, um, you know, and, and her position in government. Mm-hmm. You know, those are all things that were actually true about Trump. Uh, <laughs> right. But he, you know, that's an old tactic. It's a tactic used by everyone from the GOP to, you know, Russian propagandists to accuse your opponent of what you're actually up to. Uh, I think it's pretty clear now what Trump is up to, given his cabinet selection and his positions. Um, so unfortunately, you know, Americans are going to, to learn that the hard way. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's almost, like you said, kind of an act of disguising oneself uh, and one's uh, maybe motives and um, actions. Um, as a member of your, yourself of the media, um, you've mentioned this a few times already, but specifically what ways do you think uh, that media and you know journalism specifically have been complicit in Trump's victory? Like what is the media condition that has helped this kind of um, kleptocratic uh, maniac <laughs> come into office? <laughs> Uh, I think they're very complicit and have been from day one. I mean, the first thing they did is they overcovered him. They gave him much more coverage than any other candidate, and they would let his rallies air um, on TV for hours at a time, which is something, you know, I study authoritarian states. Like, this is the kind of thing you would say in a country like Uzbekistan, or you might see in, you know, in Russia, um, right. you know, or other uh, authoritarian or semi authoritarian states. And so there's that. Um, there's also you know, a relationship with the media that went back decades because Trump has always been a prominent media um, business and entertainment figure. And so he had connections with a lot of the network heads of cable news outlets in the United States. For example, Mm -hmm. CNN CEO Jeff Zucker has a framed tweet of Trump's on the wall. Um, And he was also (laughs) the person who produced The Apprentice, which is Trump's show. So he had that kind of connection. Um, You know, there were blatant statements from people like CBS's Les Moonves that this is a, you know, a candidate who's going to rescue us financially. And he said, you know, he's bad for America, but he's good for CBS. You know, they didn't care about, um, you know, the moral effects of this. They didn't care that this was prompting hate crimes and actual physical attacks on vulnerable Americans. They cared about money. Um, And then another aspect, I think that people are very reluctant to talk about in media, and I'd really like to know the extent of this, is threats. Um, you know, some people have come forward, like Megyn Kelly, and said that they were threatened by the Trump team to the point that they were threatening to harm her children and she had to have armed security. Wow. People from the Associated Press said that they were threatened. Right. Uh, many journalists who were Jewish were bombarded with anti-Semitic uh, you know, threats. Trump threatened uh, news anchors on Twitter, like uh, Mika and Joe from the show Morning Joe on MSNBC, and then shortly after he threatened to reveal secret information about them, they changed their behavior towards him and became very favorable. Mm-hmm. And again, that's the kind of thing that you tend to see in a dictatorship. And so he really knew how to how to work the media. Um, and, you know, in turn, they, they really favored him in their coverage, you know, all the while while he was pretending to hate them, <laughs> which, again, is a tactic, uh, you know, in order to make it seem like they weren't biased to him. He constantly criticized them, called them in the media his enemy had his fans at his rallies, you know, attack the media and encourage that kind of behavior. But that was just an illusion. That was just to make it seem like they weren't his best friend, which is, you know, what they were all along. It's interesting that you mentioned that, too. That is, like, Trump, as much as he's positioned as the media's enemy, and I've I've encountered this as well in in, uh, people who are a little bit sympathetic towards him, that he was, um, the media treated him in a biased way, this idea that he, you know, he was treated with more bias. Um, than Clinton. But the fact that he's so lucrative, I mean, just to play devil's advocate, what is the or what do you think the media's responsibility should be? Because if you have a candidate that's, you know, engaging in all this ridiculous behavior, um, it's kind of tough to resist that. Right. If you know that that will pull in views uh, and clicks and whatnot, like what, what is the responsibility that the media has um, when covering politics? Well, the media's responsibility is to the public, and it's a responsibility that involves accuracy and I think also standing up for the most vulnerable citizens who are attacked by this. And this idea that you need to cover Trump favorably um, in order to get 
these kind of ratings is really false because the Trump scandal will get you just as much money and just as much, you know, as, as many mm-hmm. clicks okay. and ratings as, uh, you know, a positive thing about Trump. Like when the Access Hollywood tape leaked, you know, that was an enormous story. It was very negative for Trump. Yeah. And I'm sure it generated a lot of revenue for people. And so this decision to cover him in a favorable way and to play down, you know, I think some of the more serious things, um, you know, like he won't release his tax returns, his ties with countries like Russia, the people he selected um, to back him, like Paul Manafort, who's propped up dictators around the world, or Steve Bannon, who's a white supremacist. You right. know, those, are, those are people that you don't, you know, at least I don't want, uh, associated <laughs> with my government. Um, and that's the kind of thing I wish the media looked into more, and they didn't. Um, you know, they just avoided it. But they certainly could have done thorough investigative reporting of Trump and gotten very high ratings for it because regardless how you feel about him, you know, he's a fascinating individual. People are drawn to any kind of story about him. So, you know, they they could have done that and it would have been fine. So you're saying that kind of in an ideal democratic society, the media's job is to um, speak for the population and keep those in power in check. Yes, exactly. I mean, that's that's what journalism is about. And, you know, it's particularly important in an election. And I think it's especially important when people are harmed due to the actions of Trump uh, and his team. You know, we've already had a large number of hate crimes that began from, you know, the time of his campaign. Yesterday on Twitter, he attacked a, a union boss by name, just a regular guy from right. Indiana, and that resulted in, you know, threats and attacks on, on that man. And so he's endangering people's physical safety. And so I think that, you know, journalists of anyone should understand this because their physical safety was also threatened by Trump. So mm-hmm. I don't understand the unwillingness uh, to stand up for themselves and to stand up for the American public, um, you know, because that, that's their job. And these sorts of uh, attacks and this sort of rhetoric should be covered. Do you think um, that uh, Trump would have that kind of success that he's enjoyed um, in an age without Twitter, maybe his most favorite, um, you know, piece of social technology? Yes, I mean, I do, because he's, you know, he's been around my entire life. Like, Mm -hmm. I'm in my 30s, and I really don't remember a time before Donald Trump. And so, (laughs) you know, he was very good at manipulating tabloid New York media. He was good at uh, reality television. You know, he's very good at whatever kind of media environment he enters. I think uh, he's at a unique advantage now with the Internet because, you know, there's so many sites, and it's very difficult for some people to tell, you know, the veracity of what they're reading. There's Mm -hmm. also a very damaged uh, media economy, you know, in which newspapers and and cable networks and whatnot that used to be financially stronger are now desperate. So they'll air all sorts of content uh, very quickly without validating whether it's true or not and, you know, often sensationalizing it to get ratings. And all of that works very well to his advantage. And, you know, Trump's nature is to take a business that's dying and shake it down for whatever he can. He did this with the housing industry, uh, Mm -hmm. and he he did it with media. So he just sort of extended that same philosophy into the media economy, and it it benefited him enormously. Wow, that's fascinating. Um, You've mentioned that you've studied um, authoritarian regimes globally um, uh, and historically, and I'm wondering, can you contextualize for us uh, Trump's victory uh, in terms of the global trends that we're seeing? Like I'm thinking of, you know, the National Front in, in France um, and even in Canada, the Kelly Leach type of figure where there's a, a surge of populist politics across the West. Like what is happening on a global scale to lead to this? Yeah, that's a great question, because I think one of the most misleading things that Trump put out about himself and that the media accepted is that he's an isolationist and that he mm-hmm. wants to put America first, whereas in reality, he's putting America last, and he's linked to a global group of oligarchs, often with very uh, white supremacist tendencies, Islamophobic tendencies, that are uniting, um, you know, for these kind of movements. You see this in France, you see this in the UK with Brexit, in Austria, in Hungary, uh, and I think you see it most of all in Russia. Um, And the relationship that Trump has with Russia is very interesting because a lot of, uh, you know, his campaign staff uh, was involved in Russia, including with, um, you know, elections that Russia had intervened in with, you know, Paul Manafort in the Ukraine, for example. But also Russia has been training 
U.S. white supremacists. They've been bringing them over there and, you know, sort of showing them how to build movements. And really? so there's been this international movement of, you know, on one hand, um, kind of low-level white supremacist organizations, and then also an international conglomerate of billionaires, oligarchs, and others who are, you know, have a personal stake, uh, a financial stake, and kind of shaking down all these countries for what they can. And so those two things are combining, I think. You see the white supremacists working on the local kind of populist level, kind of getting the population, you know, riled up around the candidate. And then behind the scenes, you see, you know, these, uh, you know, much wealthier, much more powerful people right. doing a shakedown of these countries, uh, privatizing things for their own personal benefit. And so that's unfortunately, you know, what's happening in the United States and it's happening around the world as well. Uh, and it happened in Russia before it happened in these other countries and they contributed to that. What are the conditions of that kind of um, populist movement? Like you've mentioned uh, so many uh, fascinating ideas I want to pick up on, but do you see this as kind of a, an extension? I'm thinking about the the, uh, the Bill Clinton era and the promise of globalization and kind of the, the globalizing of markets and the extension of a global capitalism. Is this the natural endpoint of, of capitalism where you have a more rigid economic um, hierarchy where those who are at the top kind of take advantage of uh, instability at the bottom to ascertain like more power and and, um, and wealth? Yeah, I mean, it's certainly capitalism at its worst. It's kleptocracy, it's, you know, plutocracy. There's been an enormous growth in income inequality um, since the Reagan era, you know, that increased during Clinton's era and really increased, um, you know, during George W. Bush. And I actually think a lot of the economic conditions that we're dealing with now were caused by the Bush administration. When Obama was elected, um, he inherited the recession that was caused by the Bush administration and by this, you know, absolutely out-of-control financial system system where you had people like Bernie Madoff, you know, shaking the country down. Right. Um, you know, that was that was something that came out, you know, as, as a growth of his rule. Um, I don't think that Obama successfully fixed this. You know, and of course he had opposition in Congress. You know, the Republicans would block a lot of initiatives that could have been economically beneficial. Right. But I don't think that that administration necessarily saw how vast the gulf had become between, you know, cities like New York and D.C. and places like St. Louis in the middle of the country uh, where I live. They didn't realize that it's not just about unemployment numbers, it's about underemployment. Like if you lose your good middle class job and you end up working at McDonald's, you know, making minimum wage, Mm -hmm. you're still counted as employed. And so statistically things might look okay, but in terms of people's ability to make a living uh, and pay their bills and have a good life, you know, that really went out the window for the last eight years. And Trump managed to, you know, to tap into that. Um, You know, so did Bernie Sanders in his own campaign. Mm -hmm. Clinton, you know, I think tried to, uh, but because she was associated so much with, you know, with her husband's administration and with D.C. and stuff, I don't think people took her as seriously. But in terms of her policy objectives, she certainly would have been more prepared to, to fix these problems than Trump, who seems to have no interest in fixing these problems. Right. Um, and just picking up on that as well, in what ways you've mentioned this idea of disconnection between, you know, the, the thing you're studying um, uh, and, you know, the, the, the disconnection that's created by looking at something on a mass macro scale, maybe, um, in terms of statistics. In what ways has the left failed uh, to allow for Trump's ascendancy? I'm thinking about that theme of disconnection that we've heard in the days since the, the victory that's been thrown uh, at the Democratic Party. Yeah, I mean, you know, the Democratic Party right now is failing by not you know, calling for an investigation of all these obvious conflicts of interest with Trump, um, you know, his, his failure to divest his businesses from the government, his, corrupt, his corruption scandals, uh, you know, Russian influence on the election and hacking, all those things should be investigated now by both the Republicans and the Democrats. But you're only seeing a small group of people doing that. And so that's what's happening at kind of the government level. Um, in terms of, you know, opposition to Trump as a whole, you know, it's very fragmented. Uh, there's still a lot of animosity left over from the primaries, which, you know, I think is extremely counterproductive. I think this is right. not the time to re-get, relitigate, uh, you know, the primaries or the election because we have about a month and a half until he's put into office. And, you know, I think that Trump is going to pose a serious challenge to our freedom of speech, our freedom of assembly. And, you know, this is a time to look forward and figure 
figure out, you know, in a unified way, what are we going to do, uh, you know, with this president who really resembles, you know, a, a dictator in certain respects um, and definitely doesn't seem to have, you know, the interest of the American people at heart. Um, so I think it would be more productive to kind of, you know, think about how, how we can, you know, work together, you know, with that goal um, in order to prevent people from suffering. Under the status quo um, that we're, we're seeing now in the wake of the uh, electoral victory, um, how do you see American authoritarianism emerging, if at all? I think it'll emerge. I think it will emerge um, and has okay. been emerging, in a, but in a way uh, that is a little less recognizable, I think, um, than people are expecting. I think if you haven't studied authoritarianism, you know, maybe one or two countries come to mind. Like you'll think of Hitler in Germany or Mussolini right. in Italy, or, you know, you'll think of, uh, you know, Russia or maybe, you know, Turkey, which has gone that way now. Um, mm-hmm. This is going to be, you know, an American authoritarianism. So, you know, to take one example, um, you know, I think that there'll be attacks on free speech. And in other countries, you might see something like state censorship, where they just flat out tell you, you know, you can't say that, you're going to go to jail. I think we're going to see things like excessive litigation, which is a very American phenomenon, to get ah. just sued out of existence. Um, right. And I, you know, you're, I'm also starting to see buzzwords thrown around uh, that remind me of the kind of things I see in authoritarian states. You know, Trump's team is using terms like economic terrorism to describe protests, you know, our freedom of assembly, which is a constitutional right. Mm -hmm. And so I think that they're just going to, you know, redefine away our rights um, as, you know, acts of criminality um, or as terrorism in order to clamp down you know, on us as citizens, and they'll do this in a way that, you know, exploits our existing fears about terrorism and crime, um, you know, under the illusion of keeping the country safe, kind of similar to what George W. Bush did, um, but without, you know, the obvious impetus of of 9-11 that allowed things like the Patriot Act to go through, I think we're going to have, you know, a lot of just, just stretching terms to, you know, suppress fairly mild or peaceful, you know, protest actions and speech. So you think that this will kind of um, reach the, the nadir of the logic that led to things like the Patriot Act? Like this will. Yeah, I mean, I, I think once Trump gets executive power, mm-hmm. I think it's quite likely that he's going to rewrite laws because that's typically what an autocrat does when they get in there. And that's why it's so dangerous, because once that happens, it's very hard to get them out. You know, people talk about the 2018 elections or they talk about 2020. And, you know, I'm thinking like our country may be unrecognizable by then. We may not wow. be having the kind of elections. You know, they're already talking about suppressing voter rights. Right. Yeah. Of, you know, minorities, of immigrants, um, you know, those are all things that, that we need to, to look out for because, you know, once somebody like Kim gets in, things can change very quickly. And there's all sorts of pretexts that, um, you know, autocrats can fabricate in order to, to rewrite the laws, to get rid of the kind of constitutional uh, protections that we've taken for granted, mm-hmm. to get rid of the system of checks and balances. Um, you know, in regard to that, you know, we have now a GOP dominated Congress. We may have a, a very conservative Supreme Court. And so there's not really going to be, uh, you know, much opposition to this unless I think hopefully, hopefully the Republicans will realize that they too uh, will be very much hurt by the <laughs> Trump administration. Yeah. You know, almost everybody is going to, except for the small group of elites that this will personally benefit in terms of shaking down the country for money. So it could be that down the line, you know, people will want to change what he's doing. They'll want to oppose it. Um, But I worry that by then it'll be too late, that a lot of our laws and rights uh, may may be gone by then. So I think, you know, now is the time to kind of critically evaluate what he's doing, look for potential dangers, um, you know, and figure out, you know, what he may plan in the future so that we can prevent it. Can you outline those dangers? Like uh, as someone who's kind of an expert in in studying um, these forms of government, what are the the most important markers for, you know, finding out that uh, kind of finding out an authoritarian trend in your own government? Like what markers should we be keeping our eyes open for? Um, well, there's all sorts of different types of authoritarian states, and I think the model that we're closest to, to emulating is the kind of kleptocratic model that you see in former Soviet countries um, like Azerbaijan or Russia. 
or, you know, in a more extreme version of Uzbekistan, um, where it's really about, you know, the family of uh, the ruling leader um, and how much money they can make and how much money their cro- their cronies and lackeys can also make. And so you see Trump, uh, you know, putting people in the cabinet uh, that basically look like they want to destroy the institutions that they're supposed to be protecting. You know, like mm-hmm. the person in the Environmental Protection Agency has no interest in protecting the environment. Right. The yeah. person who's, you know, the labor secretary has no interest in protecting labor. Um, and so I think that, you know, there's a total disregard of the safety um, and, you know, the the prosperity of American people there. Um, and I think the goal there is going to be to privatize things, to, you know, possibly brand them with the Trump marker mm-hmm. in order to accrue as much wealth as possible. And, you know, one big red flag with this is the insertion of his children into the administration, his grown children. Right. Um, cause, because they have no business being there. Uh, they're not qualified for any of these positions. They're getting security clearances for no apparent reason. Today I read Ivanka uh, is going to step in and be the first lady in Melania's <laughs> place, which is extremely strange. Oh, um, yeah. But it's actually not that strange if you've looked at post-Soviet authoritarian states, because what the dictators do is, uh, you know, when there's a conflict of interest between their businesses and the government, is they have it, you know, they have the kids handle it. They, like, you know, mm-hmm. siphon that money away to the children and put it in offshore accounts. So there's that. Um, but then there's also the, you know, the bigger problem of our civil liberties um, and the mass movement of bigotry and white supremacy that is sanctioned by this government, um, that's openly desired by it, and that seems to be, you know, desired by the media. Like, I read so many puff pieces this week about neo-Nazis. Like, they just describe what kind of clothes they're wearing or try to normalize them in some way. And these are people who are doing things like calling for ethnic cleansing. And so I think when you have a country that's, trying to normalize things like ethnic cleansing or, you know, racial hierarchies, like that's extremely dangerous. And as this goes on and people begin to just accept this as a new standard of normal, um, you know, that puts non-white and non-Christian citizens in immense danger. You know, the Muslim registry is another example of that. It's one of those things where you think, well, you know, they're not going to do that. Like that's so blatantly anti-constitutional. But I do think they are going to do a Muslim registry. And I do think Muslims you know, are in danger in the United States now. And, you know, civil liberties groups and other scholars of uh, authoritarian states think so as well. So, you know, these are all things to to look at. It's a manifold, you know, multifaceted problem. I think yeah, for Trump, for sure. the key goal is to make money, you know, that, and to mm. get attention. Like, those are basically his only goals. But for <laughs> his backers um, and other people in the cabinet, I think there's a darker uh, agenda that has to do with, you know, white supremacy right. um, and, you know, in, in Islamophobia and attacking vulnerable citizens. So you'd see people like Steve Bannon and Mike Pence as the, the I guess, uh, truer ideological monsters. Um. Yeah, definitely, yeah. Or, or Jeff Sessions, or people that are kind of still lurking behind the scenes a bit, like Paul Manafort and, and Roger Stone. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think that those are all pretty influential players. I think of all of them, you know, Pence is the sort of most traditional, uh, you know, right. the traditional Republican, but he is extreme, you know, uh, even by the standards of Republicans, he's extremely right-wing, so things like gay and lesbian rights, uh, abortion rights mm-hmm. would be in danger um, under Pence. Steve Bannon is very dangerous. Um, he's basically an, an accelerationalist. You know, he has said before that his goal is the destruction of, of the state, meaning yeah. the United States. Um, you know, he has said that openly in interviews. And the cabinet uh, picks, you know, really reflect that kind of ideology. And so it's horrifying to see that in action because it's one thing when it's a theory. It's another thing when you're actually hiring people that have the capacity to carry that out. It's interesting because I think one of the most terrifying things um, that I've heard was something you wrote when you said um, like a motto of dictatorship is that it can't happen here. Um, That kind of thing we tell ourselves while we watch our institutions kind of crumble around us. And um, in the, you know, the threat of that, um, the face of that threat, I'm wondering if you could maybe identify who, you know, who are the most vulnerable groups right now um, in the United States and maybe the West at large? And how do you think that they are going to be tangibly affected going forward? Um, Yes, dictatorship absolutely can happen here. And, you know, our institutions have been crumbling to the point that someone like Trump was able to come in and exploit that fact. 
I think that the most vulnerable people are, you know, the people who have historically been the most vulnerable, which is, you know, non-white citizens, non-Christian citizens, uh, poor citizens, and people who fit into all of those categories. So, you know, Trump has targeted people in certain groups openly. You know, as I said before, he has, you know, openly uh, targeted Muslims. He's targeted Mexicans and talked about mass deportation. You know, that's another danger that could rip families apart. Um, mm-hmm. You know, he's very racist. He has a track record of, you know, racial animosity against black Americans. He has Rudy Giuliani, uh, you know, is famous for his stop and frisk policies and anti, uh, you know, black um, actions when he was mayor of New York City. He has Jeff Sessions, who's a noted bigot. Um, He's backed by the KKK. So I think, you know, black Americans are in a lot of trouble. You know, movements like Black Lives Matter have been designated, you know, hate groups or terrorist movements by people involved with the Trump administration. So, you know, their move for civil rights um, is in jeopardy. I think women will have a very difficult time, um, you know, both in terms of just being treated, you know, with dignity and respect, but also with particular issues like the right to an abortion. You know, you already see states moving um, for fairly extreme policies, you know, like uh, making it that you, in Ohio, for example, that you can't have an abortion after six weeks. You know, that's, right. that's yeah. new. Um, you know, that's that's an example of a sort of accelerated conservative stance. And so I think just, you know, look at the history of the United States that who's fared very well throughout it. It's been rich white men like mm-hmm. Donald Trump. And I think those people will, will probably be fine. And I think that the rest of the country, you know, which is the majority of the country is not rich white men, yeah, uh, yeah. are in a lot of trouble. Um, looking at that possibility, um, how do you think we should move forward? Like, what is the most effective course of political action right now? Because it is, you know, seeing something like this happen, uh, something that so many of us thought would be impossible, um, we all are just we're just kind of stunned, right? It's hard to see a way forward. It's easy to lapse into cynicism and, and nihilism. Like, what is the most effective way to push back against the status quo right now? Uh, I mean, that's a difficult question. Yeah. You know, I think one thing to to always do um, is just never accept this as normal. You know, to wake up each day and try to retain the mindset that you had uh, before this happened and judge things by those standards and not, you know, accept, um, you know, cruelty and not accept bigotry or, or kleptocracy or corruption as things that you should, you know, expect in American life because you should have higher standards for yourself and higher standards for your government. And I think documenting that process is important, um, you know, writing okay. things down tracking what's going on so that you can, you know, you can look back and see that process. In terms of organizing, um, you know, I think local organization at this point is probably more effective than national. Um, okay. It's good to support national groups like the ACLU or the Southern Poverty Law Center, you know, which deal with these issues. But I think that one of the, the things Americans are struggling with is, you know, who can they trust? Um, and, you know, this comes down even to what is our reality? Because, you know, there's been so much uh, media obfuscation that it's difficult to define it. But when you know people personally, you know, when you know people face-to-face, your neighbors, your town, your city, then you can establish those sorts of relationships. Um, And then when you know like-minded people, you can organize with them. You know, and I also think it's important, you know, when you live in a diverse community, uh, to be an ally for people in your community who are potentially going to be victimized by these policies. And to show that, you know, you're willing to stand up for them, um, that they're not alone in this, you know, that people will work together. You know, I'm glad to see some of that happening, you know, where I live in St. Louis. Um, You know, there are movements like that. And I think those are, are powerful because, you know, no one can take that trust away from you. No one can take, you know, your conscience away from you. So if you hold on to those things, um, you know, it's a very uphill battle that we're facing, but you at least can kind of, you know, get through it uh, with your morality intact. Wow, very well said. Um, Focusing on that local level, um, that communal level, um, what do you think the key institutions are that uh, need to be strengthened in this time and maybe have been weakened and have that weakness that has, you know, maybe resulted in Trump's victory? What do we need to focus on institutionally to try to... Um, address this? And I think that really varies from place to place. Like if you're talking about New York City or you're talking about a, you know, a small town in Missouri, right. you're going to get totally different uh, recommendations, you know, which is why I think we should focus locally. Um, I think political parties are in a lot of trouble right now and are maybe not the best places to try yeah. to 
uh, organized, especially because they're still arguing about the election and, you know, that kind of thing. Um, you know, I think a lot of kind of untraditional groups are a good route, you know, that I'm always, you know, I get a lot of emails from women and they ask me what to do. And, you know, these are women who do things all the time for the most vulnerable people in their communities. Like they're on wow. their PTA or they're helping out with elderly neighbors. Right. And, you know, just those sorts of connections are, you know, people don't think of them as political, um, you know, but they are. They're part of being in a society. They're part of, you know, being, you know, obligated to fellow citizens. And so I think there's a lot of potential in just these sort of informal alliances that people already have that, you know, are based on altruistic motives, mm -hmm. that are based on wanting, a, you know, a safer and, and happier place to live. I don't think you need, you know, permission to organize, permission to form a group, <laughs> something like that. I, right. I think that, you know, friendship and, and goodwill, honestly, can go a, a longer way than some sort of institutional format. That's a great sentiment. I'm thinking of a story um, of a fellow um, educator, my background's in education, and this, uh, this teacher who, who works with um, uh, students who come from extreme poverty. And after the election, it was just kind of a, a, a framework, an approach of saying, you know, oh, my job just got harder. I have to go, you know, back to work now. And just kind of like getting, you know, right into the midst of where the problems are going to be really surfacing in the most tragic ways in, um, in North America and maybe the West as a whole. Um, to play devil's advocate for a second, um, what do you say to the person uh, who says, you know, in the face of protests and resistance um, and organizing, what do you say to the person who says that, you know, the U.S. has a democratic system of checks and balances and Trump won a free election. So how can we condone resisting the results of this process? Well, I think, you know, if we're going to take these, our, our Constitution and our laws seriously and not just treat them as pieces of paper, then, you know, we follow through on what they say. And if they say we have freedom of speech, then we have freedom of speech, you know, regardless what Trump may define right. that as. If we have freedom of assembly, then we have freedom of assembly. And, you know, this sort of just goes back to what I was saying before about expectations and keeping our expectations from before he took power. Because if things begin to change dramatically, then the fault uh, is Trump. You know, it's not like there's been a, a sea change in the American people. You know, I think it's important to remember that only about 25% of Americans voted for Trump. About right. half of Americans, you know, didn't vote at all. And then the rest voted for Hillary Clinton, and more people actually voted for her than for Trump. So he really doesn't have this mandate. I also think that, you know, some of the Trump supporters, as time goes on, are, are going to regret this vote, because especially if they voted for him for economic reasons, you know, they're not going to get what they wanted. You're already seeing that with the, the carrier uh, plant situation in Indiana, where, you know, right. most of those jobs are indeed being sent to Mexico. And, you know, so Trump does not have, you know, one, a popular mandate, and two, you know, these laws, our laws and our democratic traditions mean something, and they can't just be magically taken in a way, um, you know, if an autocrat comes to power. That's what an autocrat, of course, you know, wants yeah. you to believe. They want people to just roll over and, you know, right. go with it and say, you know, yeah, this is normal, this is right. But if it doesn't feel normal or right, um, if it flies in the face of everything you were taught about American values, then I think it's better to be true to those values and, you know, especially to look at whether people are suffering. If you're seeing mass suffering around you, then yeah. something is wrong. And as a human being, you know, you have an obligation to try to prevent that. That's very well said. Um, just uh, kind of moving towards a summary of this, you know, entire uh, issue, what do you think the biggest strengths of the American system are that we can capitalize on moving forward? You mentioned that kind of humanistic approach of recognizing suffering and those, those kind of altruistic values. And what are the maybe biggest weaknesses that we have to kind of solve? I actually think our, our altruism, our tendency to that is kind of in trouble. Um, oh, it's not okay. really a virtue that a lot of people, you know, that, that's lauded by people. You know, you see that mm -hmm. even in our professions, that kind of, you know, nurses and teachers and other people who help others are paid very little. Um, True. You know, yeah. So there's this sort of idea that if you're, if you're cutthroat and cruel, you know, in the way that Trump is, that you're somehow better. But, um, you know, I, I think our, our strength, honestly, is, you know, we're a fairly tough population. Uh, you know, we tend to be pretty feisty as Americans. We're loud, <laughs> we're outspoken. And, you know, I think that we won't go down without a fight. Um, you know, if our 
democratic values are taken away. I think you're going to see all sorts of different people uh, speaking up and protesting, and those people might not get along. Um, there might be very different reasons to protest the Trump administration, but I think that's part of what makes America a great country. That's what democracy is, is, you know, people with differing opinions and views and, and political persuasions, and I think, you know, generally speaking, most of us don't want an authoritarian state. It's very <laughs> alien not, yeah. to the American mindset that this right. can even happen. And if it does start to happen, I think that people may start protesting, um, you know, a little more intensely. Uh, you know, the weaknesses is our institutions. You know, our institutions are really compromised. Um, our economic institutions have been crumbling. You know, people have been struggling to make a living. Uh, our government institutions are in trouble. Places like the FBI seem to have been compromised from the inside, and, you know, I, I don't really see them as trustworthy at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the same is true with our, our political parties and our Congress, uh, which has been very weak in the face of, you know, obvious corruption from Trump and his administration. So, unfortunately, you know, a lot of the burden falls on the American people at the moment, you know, which isn't fair. Uh, we're not getting paid for yeah, this. You know, right. we have elected officials who are, yeah. and I wish that they were doing a better job. Um, but, you know, you, you still have that obligation, I think, to try to just be a good citizen, uh, be a good person. I think a lot of people kind of freak out and they think, oh, God, you know, this is all happening. What can I do? And, you know, a lot of it is just that, you know, to try to be as brave as you can in the face of this. But if you can't be brave, you know, just be kind. Just, you know, be a good neighbor, help with your community, see who's, who's vulnerable, see ways that, you know, you what skills you have and what ways you can to help out. And then, you know, just do it and just you know, don't don't think about oh God is this solving everything, but just what small steps can I take and then collectively that that can really build up to something. Well that's I think that's a great message to end on. Just thinking of like how day to day can my existence improve the existence of others. Sarah, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. Oh thank you.